Hello and welcome to SLU, home to online robotic telescopes and astronomy learning for students, amateur astronomers and space enthusiasts around the world. Now, this is the first of a whole stack of live astro lessons that we're going to be broadcasting over the coming weeks to keep you hopefully entertained, engaged and educated in just about everything to do with uh, astronomy and space. Uh, so make sure you follow us at SLU on Twitter and Facebook, uh, because we may have next week some short notice events if there's any solar action going on on our local star, the sun. Now then, I know we've got a bundle of students watching tonight and a special welcome to some of the organizations that have already signed up to SLU with their own SLU astronomy clubs. Uh, so special shout out to you. We've got the Girl Scouts of Central and Southern New Jersey. We've got the high school astronomy students of uh, Walter Payton College Prep. Uh, that's in the Chicago Public School District. We've got fifth grade students from the Clark County School District in Las Vegas and uh, students uh, of the Brownsville Independent School District in Texas. Welcome to all of you and welcome to all of you other students around the world who might be homebound and going a little bit stir crazy at the moment, but uh, we've got plenty to keep you entertained and educated and hopefully out of the uh, out of the way of your parents who might be going a bit potty as well. Anyway, listen, if you are a classroom, a group of students or amateur astronomers, anything like, like, like that, check out our website uh, for more details about how you can start your own SLU astronomy club. It's all pretty cool as you get to control our huge robotic telescopes in the Canary Islands and Chile. We'll look at those a little bit later. Uh, but also you get to earn badges, gravity points and rewarded with uh, different membership levels based on famous astronomers. And it's all done uh, with our structured quest, which we're going to be walking through one of those uh, over the next hour. Now, we've just launched actually today our newest quest, and it's all about lunar phases. And we're going to do a show about that next week. It is an absolute cracker. I'm very proud of it. Uh, but anyway, that's enough of an intro. Let's meet our teacher tonight, none other than SLU's new director of education, SLU educator Russ Glenn. Welcome to SLU, Russ. How are you? Hey. And Paul, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, you're not only, uh, you know, uh, SLU's new director of education, a SLU educator. Uh, you're an ex-high uh, school physics teacher, but I think you've also, haven't you, didn't you used to have a connection with the uh, Eagle Scouts or something? Well, yeah. So one, once an Eagle, always an Eagle, Paul. So uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, definitely st still an Eagle Scout. Uh, I'd love to give a shout out to... Uh, the Tidewater Council, that's where I got my, my eagle. Although, uh, you know, also want to give a shout out to the San Diego Imperial Council. If, if any of you scouts are out there watching, I hope so. Um, I was out there as well. My father was in the Navy. And so we moved from San Diego back to Virginia uh, halfway through my, my work as, uh, in, in the scouts. So I got my eagle scout in Tidewater, but did a lot of my other work uh, out, in, out in California. So... Um, yeah, Excellent. love to give a big shout out to those scouts, any scouts that are watching. Um, exactly. Wonderful organization. Love to have love to have you guys online. Um, I am a I am a teacher. I actually am a, I'm a current science teacher. Uh, you know, I'll be uh, taking over the director of education position at SLU in June. Um, love being here now uh, to talk about some astronomy stuff. You know, I passionate about SLU, Paul, because of the amazing uh, opportunities for for students. Uh, I'm passionate about astronomy education, space science education. Uh, I love learning it. I love having kids love learn it, uh, love learning learning the, the space science. Um, the opportunities for inquiry that SLU offers, you know, giving kids control of these amazing telescopes is unparalleled. So I love that. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, we're gonna be walking through one of them today, as you mentioned, but the yep. quests are fantastic. They're a great way to walk a kid through and through a topic for them to learn something um, and come back with more questions that'll that'll lead them to their own inquiry, uh, maybe lead them to other quests, you know, level up and uh, and and earn those gravity points. So um, super excited about about SLU and all it has to offer. Excellent. So so you mentioned our lesson tonight is going to be based on one of our quests. What are we going to be doing, Russ? kick us off with this i'm gonna jump in every now and again on behalf of viewers if we've got any viewer questions um and also maybe talk a little bit about how people can control the telescopes and stuff like that but over to you russ 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, today's quest that we're going to be going on is our Cosmic Explorer quest. So uh, this is a, a really wonderful um, entry level quest. Um, but but when I say entry level, it's it offers a lot for everybody. So even if you know something about space, uh, you're going to learn something new here. Uh, as we all know, or maybe we don't, but as we all know, as educators, uh, education is it spirals. You learn something, uh, you retain some of that, and then you forget it. So it's important to, to spiral back on that information and, and check it out a bunch of different times. The wonderful thing about these quests is you get to choose your own adventure in a way by choosing your, your images. Um, and the quests offer a step-by-step -step way of walking through a topic. This particular one is going to walk us through uh, an introduction to using the SLU telescopes. It's going to walk us through an introduction to some of the most amazing, uh, some of the amazing uh, celestial objects that are in our local neighborhood, as well as deep sky. You'll hear me use that term celestial object, celestial body. Uh, for those of you who are out there listening, uh, what's the difference between a celestial object and a celestial body? Well, really nothing. So you might hear me using those interchangeably. I'm just talking about objects that are out there in space, uh, something for us to discover and to uh, interact with. The great thing about space science is there's always something uh, new for you to learn. You can see up on the screen here, this is the start of our quest. Uh, this has a little poster uh, along the way. You know, when you do this quest, you'll be filling in those images on that, that poster and you'll be able to download that, print it out, put it somewhere cool around your house uh, you know, uh, when, you, when you're finished with this quest. Now, that won't be today, but hopefully you'll join us again and, 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 uh, and go on this quest again on your own. Uh, hey, Paul, yeah. all those uh, spaces there are images, are places where where students could put an image. Would you mind walking us through uh, the process for actually planning an, an image, or planning a mission to look at one of those objects? Exactly. So as you say, this quest is all about, you know, collecting all the different types of objects that you can you can capture with SLU's telescopes. And we've got a whole bunch of telescopes that are good at doing different things. So we can see here, actually, if we're going to look at how we can actually um, reserve and control the telescopes. But if we just click on, say, the moon one here, because this is uh, how you actually select it, all of the images that you capture using SLU's telescopes get saved in your own personal My Photo Hub. So here we've just clicked onto that, and here we can see all of the moon images. And you can see we've got some big moons, we've got some little moons, stuff like that. That's just because of all the different types of telescopes. Uh, and they different fields of view and stuff like that. But let's show uh, students out there just how easy it is to control the telescope. So if we hop over, let's actually hop over to the observatory page, first of all, because we need to see whether or not the, the telescopes are online. We had some bad weather earlier. So we'll take a look at our special all sky camera. This is a camera that, oh dear, that's not looking so great. Uh, it looks a bit dark and dingy, doesn't it? Well, that's because we're looking through some clouds at the moment. So telescopes, so you can see the domes on the left hand side there, they're not open, but if we hop over actually to the Chile page, um, let's just, yeah, we can see there actually the time lapse of the all sky camera. It looks like you're lightning. Oh, we can see a few stars kind of flashing through the clouds there, but let's check because we've got the Chile observatory as well. And this is always the cool thing about SLU, having two observatories, one in the Northern hemisphere in the Canary Islands, one in the Southern hemisphere at Chile means that we've got all sky coverage. Oh, this is looking a bit better. Look at this. Now, there you go, Russ. So That's this is once about. again, another 180 degree field of view camera looking directly up at the sky. And we can see the SLU dome there off in the distance. That's at the top. The very bright thing on the right hand side, just setting to the west, that's the sun. So we know that we are only about three hours away from the Chile Observatory opening. And we can see there we've got cloudless blue sky there. So uh, pity so we're not doing the show. Tonight's going to be a good night, Paul. It's going to be an excellent night. And I'll tell you, members uh, today were saying how good the conditions were last night. And usually you get these conditions kind of going over a, a few nights. But anyway, let's hop off and we'll schedule. Um, we'll show people how easy it is to uh, schedule 
um, and control the telescope. So let's hop over to the, uh, the mission tab. So this is mission setup. So we call uh, when any member controls the telescope, it's called a mission, which is either a five minute slot or a 10 minute slot. And there's a whole bundle of ways that you can uh, set up and control the telescope. So we're going to use the easiest way first of all. And we'll use the example of one of my favorite objects, actually. It's called the Whirlpool Galaxy. So we all this is the SLU 1000. So we're going to scroll down. You can see it's all separated into different object types. We've got planets, asteroids. We've got globular star clusters. We've got nebulae of all sorts, stars. But we want to go to spiral galaxies because that's what the Whirlpool Galaxy is. So we click on that. And the system, you can see, it's calculating the proper time and telescope for all of this, uh, for all of the galaxies which are currently visible. Then you can choose from this list, scroll all the way down to the bottom because it's in alphabetical order, uh, all the way down, all the way down. Thank you very much. I shouldn't yeah, have pick, picked something that started with... Exactly, had to pick a W right at the end. There it is. Find a mission slot. So this is now finding the best slot. So there you go. 2155 tells us what telescope it's going to use. Tell us uh, the Chile 2 telescope. And all we've got to do is hit schedule mission. That is as simple as it gets to control a huge telescope on top of a volcano in the Canary Islands. But not only that, you know, it, this page is now confirming to us the object that we've got. So you can learn about, about it, you can learn more about it, you can go to its object page, you can set up other missions. And also it's got related guides and related objects as well in there. But before we go, hop back to the lesson, let's try one other way to show, because there might be some, I know actually there are some advanced and fairly clever students out there. So let's go to buy telescope. Now we're gonna go to the, this is a next level of how to schedule the telescope. So let's go to that same telescope. Let's go to Canary 2. Uh, so we'll click on that at the top. And this shows us the telescope schedule for tonight. Let's have a look at tomorrow night schedule. So we'll click on tomorrow night. And we'll scroll down. Let's go to about uh, 2300 UTC. UTC is this global time uh, format that astronomers around the world use, but it's really easy at the moment. It's four hours uh, behind, uh, sorry, ahead of Eastern Standard. So we click on that slot. So we've selected the telescope. We've got our Canary 2 17 inch telescope, which is humongous. We've selected the time. Now we can go into here and we can do exactly the same thing. We can choose that object, but this time we know exactly we've chosen what time it's going to be. So we'll, we'll go to um, Spiral galaxies again, down a whirlpool galaxy. That was a bit quicker, going all the way down there. Sh define mission, schedule the mission, bang. Now, what happens if you forget that you've scheduled this? Well, don't worry, you get a notification on the website. So if you're on the website, you get this little notification alert saying, woohoo, your mission is about to start. Uh, because don't forget, people are watching all of these missions live. All members can watch everybody else's missions live and snap their images from it. Uh, so there you can see it's it scheduled there. Um, but also you can do, ah, oh, let's do this. Look, there's Bode's Galaxies, one of my favorites. So that's another member who's done it. So we will look if, let's say I want to join that mission, but I can't get onto the website. So we've got something called RoboSnap, Russ. So click on that, RoboSnap to my photo hub. The system now is going to automatically save all of the images, snap those images for me uh, from the live feed and put them in my photo hub. So this is what's quite different about SLU, that you're not controlling the telescope on your own. When you control the telescope, everybody else can look in live at what you're watching but also you can watch what everybody else is doing as well. Now, with the telescopes offline right now, we're not going to be able to look at the live missions, but I do know that we've got some example missions, uh, images from live missions that we're going to look at as you step through the, the lesson plan. So hopefully that has shown people just how, 
how easy it is to control the telescope. So there's there's some more complex ways as well for really advanced people, for the really clever bots out there uh, to, to get into with coordinate missions and stuff like that for comets and asteroids and stuff like that. But I think that'll do for now, won't it? So back to you. Let's get into this quest and the lesson plan. I'm looking forward to this. Excellent. Let's let's do it, Paul. Thanks for that. And, and the other thing to mention is that, you know, if a, a, a student plans a mission and it's past their bedtime, they'll they'll snap some robo pictures for you, too. So uh, exactly. it's great if you can be be up for those missions. But if you're asleep, uh, you'll get some shots. So, um, you know, it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's really, really wonderful. You can plan your mission, go to bed, wake up and your mission is complete. Your work is exactly. done. So. <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna uh, walk through this this uh, cosmic explorer quest. We're gonna start with uh, uh, an object that's that's near and dear to all of us. It's the it's the one thing that we can all take a look up in the sky and see. Uh, it's gonna be our our moon. So we're gonna be uh, heading over to step two um, it, at the uh, for Earth's nearest satellite. This is gonna be step two in our uh, quest. And you can see the same graphic that's from the poster populates up here. Uh, you'll, you'll be throwing an image into there. But um, you know, one thing that's that's really interesting about the moon um, is that you know we all kind of know what a what a day is like on our planet. You know, it's 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 24 hours. We kind of know what to expect. We get some daylight. We get some nighttime. Uh, but uh, a day on the moon is is different. It's different. And uh, you know. If you were on the moon, you'd have a, a you'd have a much longer day. You'd you'd have plenty of time to get everything done that you need to get done because it's it's actually 29 and a half Earth days. So the moon has a much longer day. Um, you know, you're getting 14.75 uh, days of daylight and 14.75 uh, Earth days of of nighttime. So um, you know, there's there's a much different environment, obviously, on the moon. Um, you know, we uh, one one thing that I always like to mention when I talk about the moon is that uh, in in sort of our pop culture, we've heard a lot about this dark side of the moon, mm. and uh, you, we we kind of think that it's a permanent dark side of the moon. But uh, there is no permanent dark side of the moon. We can see that as the moon goes through its phases. There's there's definitely a dark side, but it shifts uh, all the time. Now there is a permanent far side of the moon um, you know that we we can't see from earth we can never see it from earth we have to send uh, spacecraft out there to take snap pictures of it orbit it um, we have seen it we've got lots of pictures of it we know the far side of the moon we know a lot about it we've got some rovers out there right now but um, there is no permanent dark side of the moon so when you're listening to pink floyd's uh, album you know uh, dark side of the moon just keep in mind that uh, that that dark side shifts depends on where you are. The moon has a day just like we do. It's just a lot, a lot longer. Um, you can see up on the screen here. This is a graphic that we have showing the Earth and the Moon uh, size scale. I also want to go ahead and for those of you who are at home and 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 you, you might want to hold this scale model in your hand. So I'm going to do a quick uh, demonstration uh, with a couple of objects that you probably have at home. Uh, and you can go and grab them after the show and uh, and and check out this uh, size comparison. So many of you have a basketball, right, in your house. So here's your basketball. This is going to be our, our earth right here. And then for those of you who play field hockey, for those of you who play lacrosse, just got to get your uh, field hockey or lacrosse ball. Okay, so... Here is our, I'm going to back up just a little bit so you can see it. Here is our Earth. Okay, obviously uh, the colors are a little bit different here. Um, <laughs> it's my daughter's basketball. But uh, here's our moon. This is a field hockey ball right here. Now these are about scale. So you've got your Earth over here. Got your moon over here. Okay, about scale to each other. Not scale distance though. We are not this close to the moon, okay? We need a, I, I would need to back up a lot farther for that. For those of you who are, who use, who are used to using the metric system, where it's about seven, seven and a half meters. For those of you uh, in the United States, we're used to using 
uh, feet. So 24 feet. You know, you get these 24 feet away from each other and... Let's see, here we go. Uh, this is not quite it, but uh, pretty good, okay? So um, for those of you who want to try that at home, there's your little, there's your, you'll never look at a basketball the same way again, okay? Uh, and there's your lacrosse or field hockey ball. Either one works for this. Um, and uh, for those of you who just prefer to see a graphic on the screen, you can, we can pop back to the website, take a look at SLU's uh, a slew's own graphic there showing you that on the screen so but for those of you who are going to go outside and play a little bit after this maybe play some basketball well there you go you've got your your earth in your hands right there um so we might we might do a few dora the explorer moments here where i ask you some questions and then you can you can yell them at the screen uh you know how did the moon get here all right, good answers, good, good answers. I'm gonna introduce you to a few of the different models that have existed um, uh, regarding the formation of the moon. And then I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you a little bit about the most current, uh, currently supported model of the lunar formation. So we've got this, um, for that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and do another demo. Uh, so so here. all of this information, Russ, that we're seeing, this is part of the quest. So you're going, you're working through all of this in the quest. You're capturing your photos, putting them in the quest, and then going through all of this. And there are questions and stuff like that, so you can test what you've learned as well, aren't there? Yeah, for sure, for sure. At the, at the end of every section, we've got some multiple choice questions, oh. um, you know, that'll, that'll sort of make sure that you were paying attention when you were reading. We're getting a little <laughs> bit of a, of a preview here of the, uh, of, the, of the giant impact theory. I am going to talk about a couple of the other theories as well, and I've got a little bit of uh, Play-Doh here to, uh, to demo this. So you, you too probably have this stuff at home, uh, a little bit of, of Play-Doh. Maybe you've got some model magic. Uh, who knows what you've got? But I want to demonstrate a couple of the different models uh, that preceded our current understanding of lunar formation. So uh, one of the models is something called the co-accretion model. So accretion is when stuff comes together. So the idea is that this stuff would have been out in space, lots of it floating around, um, crashing into it, into each other because the solar system was forming at the same time. And so the idea is that the Earth formed, and at the same time, out of the same stuff, we get a moon. Okay, so here's our Earth forming. Uh, I didn't do a great job on the forming Earth, but uh, you get the idea. <laughs> Okay, so they're accreting, they're, they're forming out of the same stuff. That was one early model of, of how, the, uh, how the moon formed. Um, this next one is kind of nice because I can just keep my moon uh, together here. So we've got our, our Earth here. The next idea was that, well, perhaps, perhaps the moon was sailing through the solar system and just happened to pass close enough to our planet to be cap captured. So we get this what's called the intact capture system, okay? So the, the, the model is that the, the moon was already made somewhere else, came flying through the solar system, and we captured it with our gravity, and there we go, we've got it, okay? Now the third model, I'm gonna squish this stuff all back together for this third model, okay? This is, uh, this is interesting, this is called the fission model, okay? And for those of you who know what fission is, it's when things split apart. This was actually proposed by Charles Darwin's son. Okay, so he was interested in space science. Um, Charles Darwin's son, uh, George Darwin, proposed that our planet, as it was spinning really fast, we get this little glob that pops out and eventually bloop, pops out just like that. And um, this is the fission model. So this pops out and then it goes into orbit, you know, as the earth is rotating and all that good stuff. So um, those are three early models of uh, lunar formation uh, or how the earth got its moon. Now the current model, current model is the giant impact model. And for that, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, switch back to the website for that graphic. This is a great graphic of the giant impact theory um, of how the Earth got its moon. Now, in science, as many of you know, if, if you, you 
taken a science class, paid attention to your science teacher, you know that um, we, we're looking for the, what's the best model that answers the most questions or, or is supported by the most evidence. And this model right here, the giant impact uh, model or theory is, is the one that supports the most, uh, is supported by the most evidence. So um, a couple things that, a couple pieces of evidence that support this, a couple of them are, have to do with our own planet. Our planet has the, a tilt. So our, our planet is tilted. This could be explained by this giant, this giant impact occurring. Um, the, uh, the actual, the, the composition of the Earth's outer layer. We also, we have some uh, stuff in our outer layer um, that we could attribute to the, being from the core of this planetesimal, this object that hit us called Theia. Uh, you know, its core would have deposited things like nickel into our, uh, the outer layer of our planet. So our own outer, there's some evidence here on the Earth that support this theory. Um, there's also a couple of other uh, pieces of evidence that are supported by uh, things that by the lunar samples that we got from the Apollo missions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the uh, lack of uh, volatile elements, volatiles are things like water. Those things would have would have been vaporized in this impact. So, I mean, you're getting this huge hit, all this stuff flying out into space, all this stuff being getting vaporized. That stuff would be lacking in the moon after that as it formed. Um, and then also the lack of iron uh, in the in the lunar samples uh, suggest, and it's it's actually very similar in composition to our own outer layers. So we got the outer layers of our planet are very similar to to the moon's uh, composition, and so that also supports that this stuff came from this giant this giant impact. Um, so you know, um, I mentioned the Apollo missions. I do want to mention that we've. We've got a pretty cool anniversary coming up of, 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 of one of our, I mean, certainly all the Apollo missions were fantastic, but uh, one of the Apollo missions that, that gets a lot of uh, attention is the one that we actually didn't land on the moon. This is the Apollo 13. Uh, in about a month, it's going to be the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13. Uh, that, of course, was the, the mission to the moon where uh, there was an, uh, an explosion from some faulty wiring in their oxygen tanks. And, uh, you know, they had to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. It's pretty amazing and a testament to our human's problem solving ability that we were able to problem solve those three astronauts uh, back to Earth uh, safely. Um, pretty amazing. And that, that anniversary is coming up uh, April 11th is when they launched and they actually returned uh, on the 17th of April. So. You know, in just about a month, we'll have the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13. You'll probably hear some stuff uh, about that. Um, Paul, if it's okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about the lunar surface. Yeah, can we just uh, point out that, that this image uh, was snapped from the live telescope feed in the Canary Islands. This is a, a waxing gibbous moon. And you've just spoken about uh, the Apollo landing sites. And... If you can see that dark area just off the top, you know, just above right center, um, that's one of the, the Marys, uh, the, the Sea of Tranquility. And at the bottom of that, that's where Apollo 11 first landed. That's where mankind first put a foot on another celestial body. But this was a snap live. Uh, from the, the from the telescope feeds and we, we we cover a lot of this actually in this new lunar quest and we're going to have a quest as well about finding and tracking down and marking up all of the Apollo landing sites on the moon because they're quite spread out but uh, anyway yeah go go ahead um, let's talk about yeah, yeah. Uh, the surface of the moon perfect yeah and they and they've you know they've left behind a lot of artifacts that we can still yeah. see uh, orbit not with not with slew telescopes but with other other telescopes. Um, lo love this image. Uh, you know, it's it's great for those of you at home who are who are looking at this image. Uh, you can see the that the moon has sort of two basic terrains. We've got these dark areas, um, and then we've got these lighter areas. So we've got the dark areas, the marias. Uh, these you might hear them called seas as well. Uh, they were when seen from Earth when when we didn't couldn't see the moon as well as we could. Uh, we imagine these relatively flat areas to be uh, to be seas, to be oceans. Um, 
we now know that they are ancient lava flows. So these are these are ancient lava flows, um, and they're actually younger than the light areas that you see. So those those areas, those lighter areas on the moon, those are called the highlands uh, or the terra. Uh, these are the this is the older lunar crust, and you might be able to to discern that just by looking at these two uh, objects, and then you you think about all those little pock marks on there, all those little pock marks. Um, We'll do another Dora the Explorer moment. For those of you who are at home, anybody know what those little pock marks are? Yeah, you got it, impact craters. So we've got some impact craters and you'll notice that there's a whole lot more impact craters on those light areas, these highland areas, than there are in the Maria, the dark lava flow areas. So, um, you know, these those lighter areas have just been chewed up uh, over the years bombarded by 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 um by meteorites from space and and that that continues to to this day there's micrometeorites uh raining down on the surface of the moon um you know if you ever see an image uh you see the moon is a little bit the mountains on the moon from the apollo missions you'll see the mountains are really rounded they've been worn down by these micrometeorite impacts they're they're not they're not a lot of sharp edges up there they've all been rounded down Hey, Russ. Um, yeah. Uh, we've got a question from Jerry M. Don't know where uh, Jerry is writing from, but he's asking if the moon is so close to us and it's covered in these craters, why isn't the Earth? Why haven't we got all of these craters on the Earth? Uh, you know, you, you, you read my mind. I was going to I was going to get there. We were getting to our next Dora the Explorer moment. So I was going to I was going to ask you the same question. You know, when we okay. look at the moon, and we look around the solar system, we see that one of the dominant features on rocky planets, rocky moons, even some of the ice moons, uh, although they're, they're a little bit different, so we could get into that. But, um, but we see all these pockmarks, we see these impact craters, why don't we see them on the Earth? Let me give you a couple seconds to think about it and you try to answer that question on your own. So. Why don't we see impact craters on the Earth? Go. All right. Those are some good ideas. Those are some good ideas. And many of you came up with the, the correct answer, which is that our planet experiences weathering. So we have a bunch of impact craters uh, that, that are, have been weathered away. Our planet has been bombarded uh, in the past. We continue to be bombarded by those same micrometeorites. A lot of those burn up in our atmosphere as they, as they get here. So if you've ever seen, seen a shooting star, you've experienced a little micrometeorite burning up. Um, we do have a few impact craters uh, here on Earth that are really nice. There's one in Arizona with the creative name of Meteor Crater. Meteor Crater. <laughs> okay. Meteor crater. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, example of, a, of an impact crater. Uh, 50,000 years old, uh, but it's being weathered away right now. Now it'll it'll be eventually be be wiped away by weather. Um, now we call it meteor crater. It actually has another name. It was named. It's named the Behringer uh, uh, crater. Um, a lot of impact crater scientists will denote it as the Behringer crater, um, named after um, a gentleman who first asserted that it was a crater, uh, that this was an impact crater and not some kind of volcanic feature. So um, interesting fun fact, so, so kind of a random fact, uh, there, are, there is a Behringer crater here on Earth and there's also another Behringer crater on the far side of the moon. So when we talked oh, about the far know. side, we, we can't see it um, unless we have a spacecraft, but over on the far side of the moon, there's another crater over there called the uh, Behringer crater. So this guy, uh, for his work in astronomy and his work here on, on, the, on our planet, got two craters named after him. Pretty cool. Um, you might be able to do some research, those of you who are out there watching. Uh, there might be other people who have two craters named after them, but I am not aware of any. So go find out. Let me know what you find. Um, see if there's somebody out there with two craters named after him. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, as Paul mentioned, you know, we go into greater detail with with our, with our lunar quests. Um, but this being our cosmic explorer quest, uh, 
you know, this gets us an opportunity to explore some different objects. So we're going to go ahead and yeah. jump back to our uh, to the SLU website and take a look at the sun. Okay, so um, if, if we scroll down just a little bit on the page, you'll see there's another one of these graphics that we can fill in with with our particular image of the sun. And I, I want to do another quick demonstration before we get too far down uh, the page. I want to do a quick demonstration with the basketball again. Um, again, you know, you'll never look at a basketball the same. So we're going to do a quick demo with my basketball here. So uh, you may be able to guess what I'm going to be doing here. I'm showing you some scale sizes for, for objects. This time, the basketball is going to represent the sun. Okay, so this is the sun. I've got this in this hand. And then um, you might be thinking, well, he's going to go over there and grab that uh, lacrosse ball again or that field hockey ball again and show us the earth. But that's way too big. This is this. That's that's too big. We got to get even smaller than that. So so I'm going to actually reach over here into this little container. And I got to get a sesame seed out of here. So here's a sesame seed. It's on the tip of my finger. Can you see that? Okay, all right. So there's our Earth. We've got our sun here, really big and majestic uh, compared to us. We will see later on. It's it's not that big, maybe. But uh, well, then we've got our Earth right here in a sesame seed form. So there it is, tiny little Earth. I've got some blurring going on, but that's okay. Gives you an idea. So if you've got a, if you're eating a hamburger tonight, you got a sesame seed on top. There's your Earth. Here's your Sun. Okay. Uh, gives you a perspective on on how large they are. Now remember, just a moment ago, we were looking at the Earth being the basketball, and the uh, Moon being our lacrosse ball. So we're starting to get a perspective on the sizes of things with just these objects that you probably have sitting around your house. Um, I'm going to put this away. We're going to jump back to the website. Gives you a perspective on just how big the sun is. Now, the sun is, is enormous compared to us. It's also enormous when we think about the mass of our solar system. Yeah. So um, this uh, next image that we're going to take a look at is going to show you some of the objects from our solar system. And it's going to show you, um, it's going to show you, you know, sort of how it compares to the other, some of the other objects in here. This was a, a um, collage put together with, Images taken by the, the telescopes at SLU. So you can see the really amazing uh, objects you can take a look at with the SLU telescopes. Um, Paul, did you want to talk a little bit about this image? Yeah, so this doesn't represent the true size of all of the planets in comparison to each other. These were all taken with the same telescope, the Canary 4 Solar System Telescope. So this shows what's called the apparent size of all of the planets and the sun uh, in the solar system. So this, the apparent size is how big they look in the sky. And we know, don't we, that Venus and Mars are closer to Earth than Jupiter and Saturn. But we also know that Jupiter and Saturn are massive. Jupiter's the king of the planets, the largest planet the largest object in our solar system other than the sun. But then we've got the ice giants, two of my favorite planets, Uranus and Neptune, but they are so distant, but we can still see their moons, would you believe, through the SLU telescope. So Neptune there, the furthest ice giant, we can actually see their little bit of color uh, on the planet Neptune, but we can also see the tiny little dot next to it, and that's its moon Triton. Um, and then we've even got uh, Pluto way out there as well. Now, Pluto just looks like a tiny little dot. Um, so this kind of gives us a lovely family portrait, but it, it shows us how big these things look in the telescopes. It doesn't tell us their true scale. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what makes the sun shine what what make what brings all that power to the sun um and many of you may, may have studied this before but if not something new for you to learn this is something that you learn on these uh, on our quest is that the sun is actually powered by 
a process called fusion. So in the core of the sun, there uh, is hydrogen gas, and that hydrogen gas is under such intense pressure that it actually causes the hydrogen atoms to fuse and form helium atoms. When that happens, some of that matter is converted into energy. So some of that matter is converted into energy in the core of the sun. Now you might think, okay, so it forms, they've got that energy release, and then it comes flying out into space. And that's true, it does eventually make its way into space, but it takes maybe 100,000 years for the energy that's produced in the core of the sun to make its way out. Okay, make its way out. It's getting, there's a lot of interactions that energy is having before it makes its way to the surface of the sun and then it goes flying out at light speed into space. Uh, eventually, some of that is intercepted by our planet. A very small fraction of that is intercepted by SLU's telescopes to give us these amazing, amazing images. Um, and we're gonna take a, a look at another SLU image uh, that was taken uh, of the sun itself, a nice big, uh, image of the sun, um, and you'll notice, you'll notice that there is a, in the bottom corner there, you'll see there's the earth again to scale. So you can see that scale model of the, the scale of the earth again. So you've got getting some perspective on that, right? You got your basketball, your sesame seed, you've got some images that are backing this up so you can get an idea of that. Now this image is labeled with a few uh, of the regions of the sun. Um, or the, I'm sorry, uh, the characteristics that you might see uh, on the sun. This is why the sun is so exciting to look at, is that these things are constantly changing. You're going to see these regions change over the course of days, weeks, months, years. Um, and, uh, and we have, you know, we, we have another quest that we dig uh, more deeply into the sun. Um, but for now, we're going to take a quick, a quick break and uh, before we head out of our solar system and start taking a look at some other uh, objects, celestial objects, some, some things that are farther out. Um, so this break, you'll be provided with a couple images to take a look at during the break, and then we'll be right back. We'll see you in a minute. See ya. Hello and welcome back to SLU's first live astro lesson number one with me, Paul Cox and SLU educator Russ Glenn. We're having fun. I hope you're having fun as well. Uh, we've got loads of people watching us tonight. Uh, this image here is an archive image of uh, how the sky above the Canary Islands Observatory is meant to look. It kind of looks like it's daylight there, but that's actually the moon. But unfortunately tonight, We've got cloud, but in about three hours time, we have got the Chile Observatory opening to see some of the Southern Hemisphere gems down there with the new 17 inch telescope that came online a few weeks ago. Now, uh, thank you everybody for joining us for this first lesson. If you're interested in controlling these telescopes and doing the quests that Russ is taking us through at the moment, then you can uh, sign up whether you're an individual or whether or not you're a group you if you're a group uh, you can sign up and and start your own SLU astronomy club you get to control all of the telescopes oh russ i meant to say just before the break we looked yes. at that beautiful capture of uh the sun our local star the sun 
in glorious kind of technicolor, what we haven't actually mentioned to, to viewers is that we have a special solar telescope. That's what that uh, image was snapped from. So we have, it starts around four, uh, sorry, five or six a.m. Eastern time. Uh, that's about 10 uh, UTC or GMT uh, in the morning. And it goes on all day long. Um, and we have these, these glorious uh, image streams. It's a video, it's a live video feed of our sun. And we can see all of those features on it. But Russ, tell us a little bit. You're also uh, you're going to be our new director of uh, education. Tell us a little bit about how schools and some of the scout groups and other organizations like that uh, can leverage SLU and start using SLU in their classrooms or at the moment, obviously, uh, for a bit of homeschooling, a bit of homeschooling fun with live telescopes. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think it's a great platform. I mean, that's that's why I'm why I'm joining SLU. I love it. Uh, I think there's some fantastic features. One of the features I like uh, that I think that sort of helps with one of the really important skills is the clubhouse feature allows you to collaborate allows you to share that, that joy. I mean, when you're controlling a telescope and you're, you snap a great shot, you can share that to your clubhouse. Uh, mm. And so your friends can see it. Your friends can see it. Your friends can comment on it. Um, you know, it, it's wonderful because it's exploring space together is really what's beautiful. I mean, it's, it, we all have access to it. Um, we all have, we live on a spaceship that has no, walls, it's an open top spaceship, we can look out into the cosmos. Um, but these telescopes give us the opportunity to look uh, at things from a different perspective, yeah. and then to share that with our friends, you know, and, yeah. and uh, you know, take a look at Venus at, through the telescope and then walk outside and see it in the in the night sky. Um, yeah. I think those are really valuable things um, yeah. and helps to create a, 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 you know, a camaraderie around this subject matter, which is arguably yeah, it, the most exciting subject matter that, that you're going to come into contact with. Exactly. Schools and other organizations, yeah, they get their own private club, uh, but there's also kind of public clubs as well for interest groups. So we've got people uh, tracking comets in their club, other people tracking near-Earth asteroids, other people. There's a love of Luna for people who just love the moon my favorite Jupiter and stuff like that. So anyway, there's there's loads going on. The other thing as well, for if there are any teachers out there watching, uh, the particular quest that Russ is going through tonight um, is not aligned to NGSS, um, but a lot of the quests are. So if you're interested in that, um, then uh, that might be uh, useful to us. Russ, maybe you'll talk about that at, at the end, maybe for teachers, but for the moment, let's get back in to our Cosmic Explorer quest. We've looked at the moon. We've had a look at the scale of the planets and the moon and then the sun. What are we moving on to next? Yeah, well, well, I mean, we understand that for some people, the moon and the sun are not big enough. So we're gonna take a look <laughs> at uh, galaxies. We're gonna take a look at a galaxy that is not our own galaxy. Now we live in a galaxy. You probably know what galaxy we live in, those of you who are out there, right? We live in the, you said it, the Milky Way galaxy, right? So uh, we live inside of it. Um, when you look around and you see the stars that are out there and you look, go outside, you go for a walk, you walk your dog, you see the stars that are out there. Those are, those are all in our galaxy, okay? Um, however, however, you can catch a glimpse of, of other galaxies, right? So, so here's a portrait. Um, we, we're, we're inside of this galaxy, so it's, we've had to uh, imagine what it looks like based on our observations. But here's a, here's a portrait of our galaxy, or at least a computer portrait, right? We've put this together because... Um, obviously, you, you can't take a picture of, of uh, the outside of something that you're inside of. So, um, but here's what our, our galaxy would look like. You can see all these parts that are labeled for a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. Now, um, any ideas? We'll do another Dora moment. Uh, how, many, uh, how many stars do you think are in the Milky Way galaxy? Keep going higher, higher, keep going, keep going. Okay, good, good, you got it, you got it. It's in the billions, right? Uh, somewhere between 100 and 400 billion stars. Hard to even wrap our heads around that many stars. Um, 
And the, the cool thing is, is that we're surrounded by galaxies. Now we're gonna get into that in just a moment, but I do wanna talk about uh, one thing that's not labeled on this galaxy um, that I think is fun to talk about and is really interesting to most people. And that is the fact that there is a supermassive uh, black hole uh, in the center of our galaxy. So there's a, something called a supermassive black hole. And um, black holes are really hard to wrap our heads around. So before we do that, I want to step back to uh, something that's a little more down to earth. And that is rocketry. So we've all heard of rockets taking off and seen rockets taking off. Rockets have to reach a certain uh, speed or velocity to get away from the gravity of the Earth. So it's about 11 kilometers a second to break Earth's gravity. So if you can reach 11 kilometers a second, uh, you, can, you can break away from Earth's gravity. The reason I want to mention that is because that same concept, it's called escape velocity, uh, is really important to understanding a black hole. The larger and the more massive, I should say, something is, the more gravity it has, and the harder it is gonna be to get away from that from an escape velocity perspective. So a, a black hole is simply, and I, simply an object that's so massive that even the speed of light is not fast enough to escape. So light cannot escape. It cannot reach that escape velocity. It's why these things are so amazing and cool is that, you know, we think of light flying all over the place. Well, light can't even escape from a black hole. It's, it's not traveling fast enough to get away uh, from a black hole. So we've got one in the, a super massive one uh, in the center of our uh, galaxy, uh, four million times the size of the mass of our Whoa. sun. Yeah, so, so really big. Uh, and it's not even the, I mean, it's weird, right? Black holes are big, but they're also like small. It's kind of weird. But anyway, um, <laughs> so we've got this massive black hole in the center of our galaxy. And what we're finding is, is that these super massive black holes are found, uh, and we're not sure for sure yet, but we're finding them in the, in the mm -hmm. center of lots of galaxies. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we can't say for sure if they're in the center of every galaxy because that's a lot of stuff to confirm. But the more we look, the more we see these super massive black holes uh, at the center of these, uh, at the center of these galaxies. Um, now, what part do they play in in galactic formation? We're still working on that, but um, but they certainly are are super interesting objects. We're going to take a look at um, another uh, uh, galaxy that's out there. This is uh, M87. Now, it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, and, and you might think, well, that's not the best image I've ever seen of a, of a galaxy that's far away. But the reason I wanted to bring this one up is that uh, last year there was huge excitement because some astronomers took a picture of a black hole. And that black hole was the supermassive black hole that's at the center of this galaxy. This is M87. Um, so at the center of this galaxy, um, there is uh, a, a, another uh, supermassive black hole. Um, this one's even bigger. This one is about six and a half billion times more massive uh, than uh, our sun. Okay, so we're comparing it to the sun again. Six and a half billion times more massive. Uh, that that uh, supermassive black hole at the center of M87. And uh, this was the one that we saw last year that everybody got so excited about. It's a it's a really amazing thing to have actually been able to image uh, the uh, the black hole in this way. Um, so I wanted to bring that particular image up again, taken with a SLU telescope. Paul, you could tell us a little bit about this telescope, maybe. Um, would be yeah, exciting. This, yeah, this was taken with SLU's biggest telescope. It's uh, got a twenty inch primary mirror so its biggest piece of glass is 20 inches in diameter that's half meter 500 millimeters i mean that anybody who knows anything about telescopes knows that is huge right and it's it's our best telescope uh, it's a canary one half meter telescope not only that but it's at our flagship observatory in the canary eyes which is at the institute of astrophysics of the canary eyes 
Did you know, Russ, a lot of people don't know this, I know you do, uh, maybe some of our viewers think about it, but if you ask most people, where is the largest optical telescope in the world? A lot of them will say uh, Chile, or they'll say Hawaii or something like that. No, the largest optical telescope in the world is in the Canary Islands, way up on the volcanoes, just like SLU's telescope. So we don't look through very much atmosphere. We're normally above the clouds, but unfortunately tonight, we're below them. But you said you talked about this um, galaxy being a bit fuzzy and indistinct. That's not because the telescope wasn't very good that night. That's because this particular galaxy is what's called an elliptical galaxy. It doesn't have that same structure that we saw in uh, the Whirlpool galaxy or some of the other galaxies that we saw earlier. And we think that these elliptical galaxies were formed by several other galaxies merging together over a period of time, which may account also for this supermassive black hole at the center. But the other thing I love about this particular image is a lot of the little white dots there are stars, but you can see there's a couple there that don't look quite as crisp and sharp. Once again, that's not because the telescope's no good. That's because those are other galaxies way off in the distance. So we can see Messier 87, the giant elliptical galaxy in the center, that fuzzy patch just below yeah. that. You can see there's a slightly fuzzy looking star. That's another galaxy. Then look over to the right. There are two kind of fuzzy patches. Those are two other galaxies. So that's what I love about looking at other members' missions when they're controlling the telescopes because you see stuff that you've never noticed before. And suddenly, wow, we're not only looking at M87, but we're looking at a whole stack of background galaxies in there as well. But uh, I, 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 kind of, I kind of love this particular image. And this was snapped from the live image stream. Uh, I, I love this one because it's, uh, at, it's, it's, it's a good, simple, basic image. It's grayscale. It hasn't got any color to it. We're going to see one. I think you're going to show us one when we talk about galaxies uh, a little bit later that's in full color. It's actually one of my favorite galaxies. But oh, back over to you, Russ. Sorry, oh, well, I get thanks. excited oh, by this stuff. Great. That was great. I, I should have brought my football for when we're talking about elliptical galaxies. You know, that's a, a nice way to, to, to imagine. Um, this would be an American football, of course. Uh, yeah. You know, to imagine your, your elliptical galaxy shaped like that. And we've, we've got uh, a, a, a nice quest uh, for those who are interested in, in galaxies. Ooh, we've got a yeah. nice quest. The, that's the Hubble Tuning Fork Quest, um, uni, uh, our, I, our mystery of the island universes. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about Hubble, I actually want to want to go over to our Andromeda Galaxy uh, image. <gasps> wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And, and you know, this galaxy is so, so important, especially considering the work uh, that, that Hubble did. Um, you know, when, when we first we're looking at this image, and I'm talking about we as humans, we're first looking at this image. Um, uh, you know, we imagine this to be a, a nebula. So a cloud of, of gas in space. And it was, it was Hubble who actually figured out that this was another galaxy, that we were not the only galaxy in the universe. And that has opened up, uh, opened up the door to, to images like the one you were just showing us, uh, where, where we could see a, a couple of other galaxies out there. Um, there's actually trillions of galaxies in our universe, which is mind boggling. Um, and we, we owe it to the work of, of Hubble and other scientists who, who inspired him and were inspired by him. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, Hubble was, was uh, an, a crucial in our understanding that we were not the only galaxy in town, that, that there were other galaxies, and there are other galaxies out there. Um, he, he actually discovered that using a telescope uh, out in California, the Mount Wilson telescope, a 100-inch telescope, uh, is what he spent his time uh, looking at the Andromeda galaxy on. Um, and, and now we know there's trillions of galaxies out there, which is, which is really amazing. Um, we're going to leave galaxies behind for a moment and, and step into our, um, our fifth step along the way here and our Cosmic Explorer quest. You can see we, we really are doing a survey of things. We've covered the, the moon, the sun, uh, galaxies. Now we're gonna look at um, some things more focused on stars. Um, but 
you know, this dying star is actually another uh, going to be another class of, of images that we're going to be taking a look at, um, something called a planetary nebula. Okay, so you, you've heard me mention the word nebula. Okay, so uh, everybody loves Latin, right? Everybody loves Latin. The Latin language, uh, everybody loves it. Um, Speak it all I'm the sure time. Some, you, some, yes, all the time. Some of you are studying it in school. Um, you know, the word nebula is a Latin word. And if you study Latin, you probably know what it means. Um, if you don't, uh, take a guess. We'll do a Dora the Explorer moment. What does the word nebula mean? Okay, those were, those were some good guesses. Those were some good guesses. Cloud or fog is really the, what the word nebula means. And so we apply it to a lot of the things that we see in space um, because some of them are cloudy and foggy looking. Um, now, there is a word that's going to that's gonna trip you up because you're going to see that sometimes you're going to be called upon to say the plural of nebula, which is nebulae. Okay, so I want you all to say it with me. Nebulae. Your turn. All right, nebulae. Okay, good. So, uh, so now you, you know what the plural of nebula is. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, what a planetary nebula is. Okay, so what is a planetary nebula? We've got, again, we're back to our quest. You can see that our image that we would go and plan our mission to and capture would go right into our poster here. Um, but we are going to actually take a look at a um, planetary nebula uh, that we've captured in the past. Okay, um, and this is uh, M27, Messier 27. This is the dumbbell nebula. And you can see it's cloudy, it's foggy. What is it? Well, um, it's actually a pretty cool thing because this is what we get at the end of a star's life cycle. Now you've heard me, you've heard us talk a little bit about life cycles of stars. Stars are non-living, okay? So we're really looking at their formation uh, and their disintegration. We're looking at these, these things, but we like to think about them as alive. Um, and they certainly do have a lifespan. They form, they're born, and they live their lives, and then they die. And this particular object uh, is one that's similar to our own uh, star. And this is similar to how our own star will, will end up. It will end up as a planetary, uh, planetary nebula. So this is the remnant that'll be left behind after our star, the sun reaches the end of its lifespan. Now, don't worry, you've got some time, <laughs> okay? You've got about four and a half billion years before this happens, okay? So there's nothing to worry about. Um, uh, you know, we, we're gonna uh, do great things before the, the sun finally goes into this phase of its, of its, uh, uh, of its life cycle. Um, you know, humans, who knows where humans will be? By that time, it, it's exciting to even imagine. Um, but uh, you know, this particular object um, is, as I mentioned, the the end of the the life cycle of the sun. And so, I want to do another quick demonstration uh, that sort of walks you through the sun's uh, life cycle. Um, it starts as as a nebula. So, a nebula out there uh, coalescing, coming together, accreting uh, into this star. And so, you know, we would get our sun. Let's see, there he is, uh, a little bit fuzzy. So there's our happy little sun, little yellow dwarf star. Um, so there's our sun. Now, stars run on a particular fuel. Uh, does anybody know what that fuel is? Okay, I heard it from a few people, it's hydrogen. Yes, so, so this star made of hydrogen is fusing that in its core um, and that's providing the energy. So we kind of talked about that when we were talking about the sun. So what happens when it runs out of fuel? Well, our happy little sun uh, runs out of fuel in its core. What's left behind is this core of helium. So we're going to have all this helium in there. Now that helium doesn't 
want to fuse as readily as the hydrogen did. So the star starts to collapse and we get this fusion starting to occur around that core. So more hydrogen is fusing into helium and we get a phase occurring that is our red giant phase. Okay, so um, this looks a little bit like a clown nose for me, but anyway, we got our red giant phase. So our, our star actually swells up uh, during this phase as it's burning more of that hydrogen around its helium core. Eventually, the star will get hot enough and enough pressure so that that helium will actually start to fuse as well. Okay, so, so we start with heat with hydrogen fusion. We eventually move into helium fusing into carbon. So we're getting some carbon forming out of this. And um, we get our red giant phase of our star. So you might see some red giants around um, when you're looking at the stars. And some of those are going to be stars that were like ours that have become uh, red, that are in their sort of their red giant phase. Um, now, after that phase, after it's, after it's uh, fused all the helium that it can fuse into carbon, it's going to puff off its outer edges and we're going to get back to that planetary nebula look. So if we could switch back to that image that we were just looking at, um, this is all those gases that were around uh, the nebula, okay? These are all the gases that were around the nebula, and you see a couple of colors here. So uh, the reds that you're seeing in the image, those are our hydrogen, um, uh, hydrogen gases. So these are, you know, the outer shell of our, of our um, nebula is being pushed out into space, um, and, uh, you know, the, the blue that you're seeing in there, the, bluish and it might be um, might be some greens that you'd see to get some uh, uh, oxygen now at the at the center of this one thing that we uh, you you might be able to make it out but but probably not there is one other rem remnant that's left behind and that is another type of star extremely small extremely hot some of you might know it it's a white dwarf. So at the, at the middle of this uh, uh, image that you're seeing here of this planetary nebula, there is a white dwarf. And that white dwarf is actually putting out the energy that's exciting the gases so that we can see them. Um, now the white dwarf is about the size, at least in the case of our sun, when our sun goes through this process, the, our white dwarf that we're going to leave behind or the sun's going to leave behind is going to be about the size of our planet. Okay, so about the size of the Earth. So you remember all these size comparisons that I was doing earlier, right? That white dwarf is that sesame seed, but yet it's putting out immense amounts of energy. It's this burnt out core of the star. Um, it's all that's left and it's going to last indefinitely. Um, it'll just keep on, keep on cooking. This planetary nebula will not. This will uh, is is expanding outward at hundreds of thousands of kilometers an hour. Um, this will dissipate over time. So you know, a hundred thousand years perhaps. Um, but uh, that white dwarf will be left behind, and we see white dwarfs out around our um, out uh, around our our galaxy um, when we when we look for them. Um, so I think we're moving on to our next section, actually, of our, uh, of our uh, quest. You can see the quests are really well laid out. They've got good quantities of information. Um, they, this particular quest, I love it because it introduces us to so many different things. And then after this, you could go and pick what are you interested in. You could choose your own adventure, jump into another quest jump onto the telescopes and, and really, you know, dive into something that you're interested in. That's another thing that I love about the SLU programs is the inquiry that it allows. Uh, it yeah. really gives the opportunity for kids, uh, students, uh, I shouldn't just say kids because adults too, 
we can all jump on, we can follow what we're passionate about, follow our inquiry, where our inquiry leads us. Um, and the, it, you know, that's one place where our, where our quests, uh, many of our quests do line up with uh, NGSS guidelines are, are the, the inquiry based, uh, that we're, the inquiry that we're able to pull into our quests. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to teachers about that if they, if they want to reach out to me anytime. Um, as you can see, we're going to go take a look at another star. Uh, this is um, a, a different kind of star than the, than the sun. Um, this is one you're probably familiar with. And uh, Paul, I'm going to I want to get your perspective on your pronunciation of this star's name. So would you throw that at me? OK, so I'm not one to get hung up on pronunciation because I think it's a bit of uh, a bit of snobbery. All right. I, I think you should just launch into astronomy, not worry about pronunciation. But most people call it Betelgeuse, but we know it's not Betelgeuse. The proper way of pronouncing this is Betelgeuse. All right. It's, it's, and it sounds silly. You sound silly when you say it, but Betelgeuse um, rather than Betelgeuse. So most of the amateur astronomers and people who are into uh, astronomy that I know just call it Betelgeuse because it kind of forms, falls into common practice. So what do you call it then, Russ? What's, oh, what's, what's your? Paul, Paul I, I, I am a child of the Betelgeuse era. So right. it, for me, it has always been Betelgeuse. You know, um, I, have I mean, we said know, it three I, times I, I, yet? No, no, we, we haven't. We probably shouldn't. Uh, we don't <laughs> want anything to to interrupt this particular uh, this particular uh, lesson. So. Um, we're going to be digging into Betelgeuse, and, and the great thing about this part of the quest, the thing I love about this is that it also introduces us to um, constellations. Yeah. Constellations are the things that, that really grab us, I think, bring us into astronomy. A lot of us, it's our, it's our gateway to astronomy, is, is the, the, the stories that we learn that are wrapped up with these particular uh, constellations. Now, I, I do want to want to say one thing about constellations. Um, and it's a bit of snobbery too, Paul, I will admit, um, you know, the things that we often call constellations are actually asterisms yeah. within a constellation. So, you know, the, the Orion pattern that you see there, that's an asterism. It's a little connect the dot, uh, pattern that humans have, have made. The constellation is, is much larger than that, and it's, a, it's actually defined as an area of the sky, kind of like a county. So it allows us to know, you know, if you look to the, the Orion constellation, there's objects in the constellation that are not the asterism. It's a little bit of snobbery, not gonna worry too much about it, but, um, but just be familiar that uh, you might hear that, that term asterism thrown around a little bit too. But these constellations really bring us into astronomy, um, Orion is a fantastic constellation, and with Betelgeuse, um, either as his shoulder or his armpit, whichever one you prefer, um, you know you can you can really get into this. Now, Betelgeuse is an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, star, um, and I want to do another quick demonstration just to talk about how extraordinary Betelgeuse is, and you probably at home know what I'm gonna be pulling out. So um, <laughs> I got the basketball at the ready. We're gonna do a little bit of a, of a Betelgeuse uh, and sun, our sun, our beautiful, amazing, big sun. We're gonna do a little bit of a comparison, okay? So, so in, this, uh, in this particular demo, here is Betelgeuse, okay? So here's Betelgeuse. And I got to reach over here into this thing again, because you guessed it, our sun, oh, I didn't get one. Our sun is the sesame seed this time. Okay, Did so. Did you just drop our sun? Did you just drop our sun, Russ? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. Sorry. There's our sun. It's it's the sesame seed this time. So, you know, wow. it, it's, it's pretty crazy. So, you know, Betelgeuse is this amazing star. And when we think about how big our sun is, we start looking, we start thinking, oh, it's the biggest thing. And then we see, oh, my goodness, there's something even bigger out there. Uh, and that's Betelgeuse. Um, I want to 
bring us back to our website because our the the SLU website the the page actually has um, yeah. a nice graphic for this too. So yeah, at home you might pull out your basketball or you might just be content to look at these images on the screen. So you can see how big uh, a Betelgeuse is compared to the sun. Um, now now one thing though is that even though it's a lot a lot larger, it's actually I mean, it, it is more massive than our sun, but it's not as massive as you might expect. Okay, so we're we're looking at Betelgeuse. It's 11 times the mass of our sun, so it's got you know, it's ma it's more massive, and let's not let's not uh, uh, discount that. But certainly for its size, it's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, we might expect it to be even more massive than that. And then you've got it compared to Rigel over there, which. I don't know. Is Rigel nine? Uh, how many? How many solar masses is Rigel, Paul? Do you know? I don't off the top of my head. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head either. Um, so we got Rigel there and, and Betelgeuse. But um, I love that about astronomy. We all have stuff to learn. We we. I'd love for somebody to go out there and find out how massive Rigel is and let us know. Um, well, it's probably on for for all of these stars and for all of the objects that you can schedule in the SLU's telescopes. We have object pages, so chances are it's on that guide page. So there's a little uh, magnifying glass there, and you can search for any object. We haven't got time to do it now, but you can search for any object. Oh, we might have time to do it. Um, you can search for any object <laughs> and pull up pull up the guide page and it's got loads of information about the particular object but you can also it tells you about the visibility when it's visible each night what months it's visible in the year and also you can go straight to the schedule and you can also look at other people's images that they've captured of all of those images uh, of that object as well so that, that's pretty cool so nice nice uh there's another perspective on how big Betelgeuse is but but what i would like to do now is actually if we could uh, snap over to an actual SLU telescope image of Betelgeuse, that would be great. There it is. There it is with the telescope. Um, and uh, you know, you you might have heard Betelgeuse has been in the news lately. Um, it's been uh, behaving oddly uh, with some dimming and things like that. And and people were getting excited because Betelgeuse, unlike the sun, is actually going to uh, explode into us in a supernova event. Uh, so our sun will not explode. It'll, it'll, uh, you know, uh, become a red giant and then push its outer layers off and become a beautiful planetary nebula uh, for future humans somewhere else to take a look at. But Betelgeuse is actually going to explode. Um, and, uh, and when it does, it's going to be about as bright as a full moon in our sky, which is astounding to think about. Um, and a little bit disconcerting for people with telescopes because that's a lot of light pollution. But but uh, you know it would still be a pretty exciting event. Now the cool thing about it is is that it, if it was to go uh, supernova, if it was to explode, we would actually have a little bit of advance warning because we would detect the gravitational waves. So we've got a gravitational wave detector. We could detect those gravitational waves. Um, which are going to come out probably about a we probably have about a day's uh, advance notice of this explosion. So we might all be able to go out and just you know do a countdown Won't for you? it. The, it would be pretty cool. But um, you know who knows if that'll happen during our lifetimes. But Betelgeuse will someday explode. And this image of Betelgeuse, this is the kind of image that you would plan for. You plan a mission. You'd go and grab your own image. Hopefully you're there watching it, snapping your pictures. Otherwise, if you're asleep, the robot will take a picture for you. And then you could put this image right into your, your quest uh, slot, putting your poster together. Um, and I want to bring us back to the, um, back to the uh, website, back to our, um, our next step. Hey, hey Russ. Cosmic Explorer Quest. Yeah, sorry. Cheryl, sorry. Cheryl M. says Rigel is 21 solar masses so 21 times more massive than our sun there you go thank you awesome. cheryl and, and cheryl thank you and that's interesting right it's, so it's it's interesting it's it's one of the high mass stars it's going to even have a, a different life cycle um interesting that it's 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 more massive than betelgeuse right but yet yeah. smaller and more so compact 
that thing is burning its fuel so quickly. So those those uh, you know blue giant stars burning through their fuel. You know, Rigel's not going to last very long. Um, and and you know we could get into that too. But um, what we're going to come back here. But thank you, Cheryl, for finding that out for us. I love that. We're going to visit as we were talking about earlier. Stars are born. Stars die. They're actually born in something called a, 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 a stellar nursery. So we even apply our own, you know, human, uh, our own human context to this, you know, thinking about stars being born in a nursery. Uh, well, here they are. This is a, a, a nebula. And this is the one we're going to take a look at is the great Orion Nebula. It is a stellar nursery. It's where, uh, it's where the stars are being born. And, um, we're going to take, you can see this is where you would, you would fit in that your image that you're going to snap. This gives you a perspective within the, the constellation of Orion where this actual nebula is found. Uh, it's often considered to be, you know, part of the, uh, the sword of Orion, uh, you know, that he's holding on his, on his belt. Um, we're going to um, uh, pop over and actually take a look at a slew image of the uh, Orion Nebula. Yeah, now Russ, this was taken. This is what this looked like in the live image stream, direct from uh, the, the new Chile 2 telescope. And I snapped this particular cool. image, but it's glorious, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's beautiful. Uh, the colors are beautiful. You can see the, see the star forming region there in the middle, that mm. bright region the trapezium so um you got your star forming region there you've got all these gases out there you know so this is another you can see that the term nebula is used in lots of different ways right we've got a planetary nebula it's a star that's dying we've got uh the great uh, this orion nebula which is where stars are forming so you know clouds of gas in space are really important um they're where things are born where things die where uh, this stuff is recycled it's where um, when a star dies, it seeds the universe with new elements from its death. Um, so, so pretty cool stuff. Beautiful image that, that you snapped here, Paul. I love it. Um, we're going to pop back to our, our website because we are actually uh, getting toward the, the end. We're going to start wrapping, wrapping things up. Um, I hope this has been a lot of fun for you today. You know, this is our Cosmic Explorer poster. So we saw this at the beginning. Um, along the way, you would be taking pictures through the telescopes, collecting your images, and then selecting the images that you wanted to have in your poster. Uh, once you did that, you could download it, print it out. Suitable for framing, uh, definitely suitable for the refrigerator. Um, but the cool stuff is, the cool thing is, is that you've learned a ton along the way. And, and you've really dug into a nice survey of what is out there um, in, our, in, in, our, in our universe, um, from things that are close that you can see all the time, like the moon and the sun, to things that are really far away, uh, or things that you might need a little more training to, to take a look at. Um, so this is, this is where it ends. Um, I hope you guys learn some some great stuff uh today you certainly got a got a nice perspective on slew and how our quests uh work um i look forward to seeing you in the future uh paul uh, did you want to mention any, anything before we go or i'm sure there's well, things to mention before we go i mean first of all uh a huge thank you to you, Russ. That was uh, very, very interesting. You, you said oh, okay. that actually at the beginning that, you know, there's always something new to learn in astronomy. And it's one of the reasons why I love astronomy as a science. It doesn't matter how many, how many years you've been doing it or studying it, there's still something new to learn. And it's all fascinating to me. I just want to soak it all up. But anyway, viewers, I hope you enjoyed Russ's lesson as much as I did. Listening actually, Russ, to um, some of what you were talking about there, I think next week, um, or maybe the week after, we should do a specific lesson on the life cycle of stars. It's a fascinating subject. It's got such a lot of depth to it. It's got brilliant objects to it because we haven't talked about those. what happens with those super um, massive stars, those massive stars, what happens when they explode and the resulting objects like the Crab yeah. Nebula, that always looks great. So I think we should maybe pencil one of those in, 
pencil in uh, a show about our sun as well using the uh, special Canary 5 solar telescope. But for viewers out there, uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter at SLU or Facebook uh, to be notified about our events. SLU members automatically get an email uh, telling them that there's an event coming up. Uh, SLU members, by the way, can also watch all of our show archive as well. So if you wanted to see one of our solo eclipse shows where I go on an expedition to Australia or the Faroe Islands or Iceland or Kenya or somewhere like that, you can watch those. You can watch our supermoon shows. You can watch all of our archive shows before. And in fact, uh, Russ, you were mentioning about the constellations. Uh, there's a whole series of shows about individual constellations, which slew Excellent. storyteller Helen Avery gives. And Excellent. it is a brilliant way of learning the night sky. But anyway, uh, lesson two is going to be next week. We will confirm a day and time then. Uh, we're going to be introducing um, our new moon quest because it's new moon next Tuesday. Now, you can't capture a new moon. That's all explained in the quest. But we can capture uh, a, a very young moon, just a couple of days old, two or three days old. So we're going to try and time it so that we can spot that incredibly thin crescent moon so keep an eye open for the date of that uh we are going to do uh we're going to keep an eye open for uh solar action uh so we can do that we've also got our normal uh normal slew show which is the largest full moon of the year that's a super moon it's a full pink super moon that's on tuesday april the 7th starting at 7 30 edt um but russ have you got anything else for our viewers before we uh bid everybody farewell uh, no, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I hope I hope that you had a great time. I hope you learned something. Um, reach out to me if you're interested in talking more about SLU. It's more fun when we when we do this stuff together. So uh, it the is. community is really important. And uh, I, I love your idea, Paul, about, about taking a look at at large stars. Um, they're crucial to to our biology, too. I mean, we're yeah. we're embedded with atoms from those stars. So we'll talk more about that. That would be super fun. I had a great time. Thanks for having me. That would me. be a good so uh, thank you for everybody for uh, tuning in and watching. We will see you next week. And uh, hopefully, actually, we'll see you in the SLU community before then, maybe if you start your own Astro Club. But uh, for me, Paul Cox, it's uh, good night. It's uh, 10 a.m. 10 p.m. here in the UK. Russ, uh, where are you? You're over in uh, Texas, I believe. Is that right? I'm in Austin, Texas, and I still got some daylight. I'll go play some basketball. See you guys out there. <laughs> You're going to get a lot of those basketballs from that manufacturer, I'll tell you. So anyway, <laughs> bye-bye for now, everybody. Bye, everybody.